You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your hosts, Thomas Ahrens and Jared Mounts. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will. Good evening, everybody. Welcome back to Fishing the DMV. I'm your host, Thomas Ahrens. Jared Mounts. And we're here with part two, part two of our little four-way into this fantastic interview. Would you like to bring our guest back yeah, in? Yeah, we got uh, Chris Arvin back with us again today. And uh, today's segment, we'll be talking a little bit about Racetown Lake, which he's mm-hmm. fished, and some bodies of water in Western Maryland. But before we get into that, uh, what Chris used to do, I uh, used to build jigs. And uh, so we thought maybe it'd be good, too, to kind of pick his brain on uh, jig fishing. Uh, a lot to know about that and a great um, great way to catch fish. And, and I do, that's another one, too, I think is kind of a lost art. Some guys still. Love the jig. I always love the jig. Yeah. But there's so much uh, tackle that we're talking to. There's so much tackle out there. We kind of jump on what's new. And mm-hmm. uh, jig is a, is a great way. And there's so many different styles of jig fishing. So, Chris, maybe start us off and just talk about some of your favorite jigs and different styles of jigs and how you fish them. Well, honestly, if you told me that, <clears throat> you know, like you just said, gun to your head, million dollars, whatever, you got to mm-hmm. catch one fish, I'm locking a jig in my hand mm-hmm. probably there you go. 90% of the time. Because... I know I'm going to get bit on it at some point. My ideal jig, honest to God, coming from Do It Molds, is their brush head. It comes through everything. That thing is really, if you could hold that up to the camera, guys, that is sexy. If you mm-hmm. are into tackle like I am, like that is amazing. Seems to be very versatile. It's uh, this one in particular, it's got a, a textured skirt and it's got living rubber tied into it. Mm-hmm. Um, probably about 2010, 11, somewhere in that. I talked to Chris Dillow. Uh, I ran into him. He lives on a private lake in Virginia now, uh, close to Lake Anna. And you know, we saw this guy out on the lake in a rat boat. My buddy had a lake house down there. And it said, like, FLW champion, mm-hmm. tour champion or something. And we're like, who is this guy? Like, so we troll motor over him. We're talking to him. And we were telling him we had a tournament coming up on the lower Potomac. Well, he was like, just Google Dillow's perfect jig. And I was like, all right. So I look this thing up. And the closest thing at the time I could find to it was the Booyah pigskin hmm. because they have a half silicone, half living skirt type deal. And it looked just like it. So when I started making jigs for myself, I was like, you know what? Just to honor him. And just, Cause that was like the first professional fisherman I had ever met. And I was like, I'm going to tie Dillo's perfect jig. And all it is, is just a black and blue jig. And it's like half living rubber, half silicone. And I kind of added my own flair to it with the, uh, the textured skirt. I like it just because, you know, if you're throwing black and blue, it's probably muddy water and mm-hmm. it's going to give a little extra vibration out of mm-hmm. that textured skirt. But uh, what's the advantage of that head, that style? It stands up. I don't know if the camera can pick this up, but when it comes to rest on the bottom, that head, the way that it's designed, will stand straight up. So to, if you're using yeah. like a, a Z Man, like an Elastec bait, and it's a cross style trailer, it's going to you know float into the defensive crawfish position. I really like that. That was kind of my draw to this thing because there's actually a company called Motion Fishing that I like them. Yeah, yeah, they, they make good jigs yeah. and they use this mold. And yep. So that was one of the draws to it. Um, once you get into the heavier brush style heads, you can actually use it as a football jig. I've mm-hmm. seen because mm-hmm. it doesn't matter if it's wood or rock; it'll come through <laughs> it. And the way that it sets up. And the way that the line ties angled, because it's a 60 degree hook, when you pick up, it just brings it straight out of the rock, straight out of the wood. The heaviest cover it'll come through. And I also like it because it's flat and I can skip it under docks mm-hmm. and stuff. Mm-hmm. So depending on, it's probably one of the best skipping jigs I've ever used. And I think the main draw to making my own is I could do stuff that, you know, long forgotten stuff like this. Like mm-hmm. that's as old school mm-hmm. and as simple as it gets. It's a full living rubber jig with a chunk on it. It's just you know there are a million things on the shelf mm-hmm. and you forget the classics they still produce they're still the little brown jig or is it what they call that on uh uh bass talk live like uh lbr like the little brown jig mm-hmm. like yeah mm-hmm. it's it's just like an olive colored living rubber with a chestnut colored brown living rubber and a, and a chunk and yeah i've probably you know there's probably been more fish caught on this style of jig than anything else uh, yeah in the world and it just works but that was the main draw is like I can make stuff that's long forgotten about or like there's a secret color that Skeet Reese had his good finish on the on the lower Potomac with nobody makes. He has a guy in Tennessee that makes his jig for him. Wow. And it was if you watch the Bassmaster 2006 Elite Series from there, he talks about this guy making him these jigs. Mm-hmm. 
So of course I pause it and I zoom in and I screenshot it and I'm like, all right, I can tie that. So I made those like stuff that you just can't get or mm -hmm. can't find or stuff that you want that nobody makes. You mm -hmm. just put it together. And it was, it was a good way to kill time. Talk was, a little bit about your brush guard there too. Like how long and what, you know, do you find you like one style better than another? Or do I'd you ever trim a, them up or? Yeah, I always trim them. Uh, <laughs> this one's kind of been damaged. It needs trimmed. Uh, when I sold them, I actually left them full because I like to give people the option, you mm -hmm. know, because not everybody likes what I like. Mm -hmm. So I would leave them full. That way, if they wanted to trim them, they could do that. Um, I don't know why I stuck a clear one. <laughs> it's probably because I ran out of black ones, but I, I, I really like the clear we guard on swim jigs. Mm -hmm. uh, but most of the time for myself, I'll trim it at an angle. So I'll fan it out and I'll leave the bottom longer than the top. Just I think it gives me a more solid hook set. Mm hmm. But it also makes the the longer you leave the brush guard on a jig, the softer it is, the easier you get the you know the the hook to penetrate mm, the weed guard. True, good point. So I, I just I, I like to give people that option, but for me, most of the time, like I'm tying this on 17 pound test, uh, seven six heavy action rod, and I'm flipping it into something nasty. This one, same way, uh, probably going to bump down to 15 because. The big thing with my jigs is I put smaller hooks in it than what it called for. I really like a compact jig. Mm -hmm. I get more bites that way. And it just seemed to, I don't know, it just, it, it drew me in. Because every time I pick a jig up on the shelf, it's got a four or five odd hook in it. And it's a big, beefy, heavy wired mm -hmm. meat hook. These have uh, two odd owners in them. And I can get away with throwing it on a 12 pound test. I've thrown them as, on as little as 10 pound test. Mm -hmm. But it's just a sticky, sharp hook, fine wire. And I, I made it the way that, you know, that I wanted to throw a jig and it, it works. But so I know before we started shooting this, we talked about like keeping it simple, but mm -hmm. I like to go down the rabbit hole. So we'll do your thing in a second. <laughs> let's, let's, let's get into this because I, I just I'm getting hot under the collar because I love this, this the little nit noity stuff. And like so when you're setting up your your system for a jig. Is it the same no matter what, or does it depend? If you're on the Chickahominy with six pounders, are you doing the exact same thing if you're still on a jig on the Upper Potomac for smallmouth, or do you, do you have little variances in what you do with your system? So if I've dialed it in and I know it's a jig bite, I'll probably tie on three or four jigs. Like if I know that this is what I'm throwing, mm. they're not eating, moving baits, I'm jig fishing, I'll have a full-size jig. So something a half ounce, five-eighths, maybe even three-quarters, depending, and full skirt, four or five odd hook contrary to what i just said and i'll have that tied on one rod and then i'll take and maybe put like a mid-size jig on another and same then, gear uh same gear for no all actually okay. like if it's a full size and a big one i'm going back with the seven six heavy the 17 to 20 pound full okay. carbon mm -hmm. just because i know that like that's i'm not kidding i'm not getting little mm -hmm. bites on that one and this one i'll bump down to like 15 and i'll throw it on like a seven foot one seven foot two medium heavy um because it's probably going to be more sparse cover and i can i still have full confidence in that gear to if i do hook a big one i'm getting it out of there mm -hmm. uh, shameless plug but cigar makes probably the toughest fluorocarbon i've ever mm -hmm. personally like used it. yeah i had a buddy hook a carp on it last year it was probably 45 pounds wrapped sure. around my chewed up boat prop wrapped around wow. my trolling motor through a pad field still landing it on 15 mm -hmm. pound test that's impressive mm -hmm. so i have full confidence in that now mm -hmm. So it doesn't, I, I, th I think people kind of get way too far down the rabbit hole on line size. You can get away with a little bit heavier in certain situations mm -hmm. that people don't think about. Like I caught fish up at Lake Frederick on 17 pound test and 25 foot of visibility, mm -hmm. throwing a jig. Only because I knew that like what was below the boat was just nasty. Mm -hmm. If it's presented correctly, they'll eat it. Which is why I like to go with the heavier head sizes sometimes. Because you turn a jig into a reaction bait. Granted, it's still a, a, a slow presentation, but if somebody's throwing a quarter ounce jig and it's just kind of like fluttering its way to the bottom, the fish get a good look at it. But if you bump up to a three quarter or a half, uh, ounce, it's shooting to the bottom like a missile. Yeah, and they're like, "Oh crap, I gotta eat that." Mm -hmm. So you can you can make a, a jig a reaction bait just by going up in head size, and that's where the bigger combos and stuff come in. But and then for your swim jig, I mean, I think we're. I could be wrong. So were we just talking about more of like the, the general way you think of fishing a jig compared to a swim jig? And is that the same tackle that you're going to use? Or if you're just swimming a jig, are you going to use different uh, tackle setup for it? It depends on the swim jig. Okay. So my favorite is, is the Dave's uh, tournament tackle. Uh, I think he hit the nail on the head with the, the shape of the head because mm -hmm. it's flat and it comes through everything. I like 
a seven foot one medium heavy. Uh, I have a G Loomis IMX Pro that I throw it on. Mm -hmm. uh, it tends to load a bit more, mm -hmm. so I don't have to worry about you know breaking them off on the hook set because I have too heavy of a rod with too light a line. Mm -hmm. Throw it on a twelve pound test, uh, usually a seven to two reel, and I'm not trying to fish above the cover with them. I like to throw the through the middle of the cover, the heart of the nasty stuff. And even with that light line and stuff, I know people kind of get leery about it, but we still get them out of it. Mm -hmm. You just got to, you know, <laughs> play them a little bit, yeah. crank the drag down. Don't try to horse it. But if that that's my go-to setup for the lighter, more finesse style, because I think Dave uses like a 16th ounce brush guard in his, and it's super light. Um, so I don't really need that big heavy line, that big heavy rod to get a good hook set. Now, if I beef up to something like, uh, you were talking about the, the no jack swim jig from Dirty Jigs, yeah. then I'll throw it on 17, 15, maybe even braid. I might switch over to 40, 50 pound braid and throw it on that. And I'll throw it on a heavier, more stout rod, but I'm still throwing it to the heart of that cover mm -hmm. and the nastiest stuff possible. Mm -hmm. I don't really like to fish above the, the structure. Mm -hmm. I like to fish in the heart of it. When, yeah. when you're swim jigging? With any jig. With any jig. Any okay. jig. Dave's is a popular brand. I'm anxious to see mm -hmm. what Missiles, Missile just came out with a new one, uh, swim I'm jig. definitely going to get good. a couple of it those. It definitely looks good. It's a nice middle ground. Yeah. Because you kind of have lower profile, the no jacks profile. or you yeah. have <clears> and, <throat> or like, you know, I, I consider this a standard size swim jig. The Missile seems to be a little bit smaller. I think they mm -hmm. use a two-odd hook in it, if I'm mm -hmm. not wrong. I think so. So it'll be a nice uh, middle ground, especially because now I can small my fish with a swim mm -hmm. jig. Like you were talking about the Susky earlier with the jackhammer. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Swim jigs work equally well oh. up there, mm -hmm. especially yeah. when the water gets hotter and they see a little more pressure and mm -hmm. stuff. So what are your favorite color? Like mine, I think a color that I personally worship is the Dirty Jigs Bluegill color, where I it was hard for me to find another color that spitting image looks like the brim that you find. Mm -hmm. Do you tie colors um, when you get into certain situations or do you not like to go down that rabbit hole and it's like, I'm going to keep it simple, kind of like Gerald Swindle says, I got mm -hmm. two different colors and that's it. And maybe sometimes mm -hmm. I'll flip flop them. Like, where do you like to fall in that? So I used to get in that rabbit hole when I was making them to where I would pull up pictures and I'd be like, all right, well, I'm going to match this swim jig <laughs> specifically to this bluegill picture. You are my hero. <laughs> and then, I would spend days just, I have one color called a juvenile bluegill. And uh, for anybody that ties jigs, oh it was backbone blue on the bottom and it was a 3D green pumpkin on the top. And it looked just like, uh, like a yearling bluegill. Or I would uh, like copper breasted brim. I would tie up a swim jig that looked like that. Or if I was fishing around shell crackers, I'd have a green pumpkin and red with something that looked like a shell cracker. Anymore, uh, I mean, this is pretty much the three colors that if <clears throat> I got to go somewhere, like if I'm fishing like I've never fished for before, I'm taking black, I'm taking green pumpkin, I'm taking white. Because with these three colors, I can make it whatever I want to. If I want an all white, I put a white trailer on it. If mm -hmm. I want chartreuse and white, I throw a chartreuse trailer on it. If I want to mimic a gizzard chat, I'll put a green pumpkin trailer on it. Uh, same way with the the green pumpkin last year we were throwing uh sapphire blue trailers for whatever reason that was hot at the lower potomac mm. and i don't know if it was looking like a like a small crab or something you know because they mm. kind of like jitter mm. through the water especially being a tidal fishery uh so i actually let my buddy throw the green pumpkin with the sapphire trailer i had a, a zoom speed crawl and I don't know if they make the color anymore but it's uh I think they call it Cajun crawl it's green pumpkin with a lot of orange flake in it and it looked like a yellow perch. And anytime we got around the perch, I was getting bites and he wasn't. Mm -hmm. We got away from the perch. He was catching them on the sapphire blue. But you can make it whatever you want. That green pumpkin and orange. I mean, it looks like a bluegill. It looks like a perch. Mm -hmm. and it's coming past them. They, they, fish's brains are so small. Yeah. They can't tell the difference. But I'm, I tell you, and I'm not a big color guy. I'm like you. I like to keep in Roger. And then when Roger tie all his jigs are very dull, mm -hmm. uh, natural colors. But he came out with a bluegill. Interesting, you called talk about the bluegill, and I tell you, I don't know if there's anything to it, but I found two totally different bites with his regular, say, just black uh, jig versus that bluegill. That bluegill, I mean, they hammer it like it's almost like they're attacking a bluegill. And I don't know if there's anything to that or not, but it's definitely it was two distinct bites. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you ever found that or not, but yeah, I um, mean, shad patterns and bluegill patterns are completely different things. <clears throat> but I like like we both like to mm -hmm. keep it simple i oh, think yeah. that's the yep. just the the easiest way to find fish to catch fish and then like if i find them on an all green pumpkin chatterbait or a jig mm -hmm. or whatever i can fine tune that later mm -hmm. which it's nice to still keep like skirt material and stuff around because mm -hmm. if i catch them on a green pumpkin and i notice that there's bluegill and stuff i can put a skirt together pretty quick and then just swap it out mm -hmm. and i have something more fine-tuned that's like a different color that's not basic mm -hmm. 
but just to find the fish and just to get the basic gist of like what I'm dealing with, these three colors are you're gonna be hard pressed to find anything better. Right. Because you know, I'm I'm on the other end of the spectrum where I should be brained in because I dr- truly believe there's a like my, I worship Aaron Martin's God rest his soul because of like his I remember this one anecdote where like he would catch one on a worm, he'd go down and write it and adjust mm. the color. I think that it is if you're in a tournament or a heavy pressure small adjustments like that will give you a percent better chance of getting a bite Mm -hmm. however for the general individual Mm -hmm. i don't think it matters right but i know from jerkbait fishing i have seven boxes of jerkbaits from when we go fish tournaments and there are times i don't know why but on something like that where they analyze it they will come up and stare at it and for some reason there's just some stupid hue that's different and you switch it out and it's it's the big change mm. so i think on some specific presentations i think going down that rabbit hole does make a difference mm-hmm. but yeah maybe if you're like speed cranking or or something like that where you're mm-hmm. ripping it past it's not necessarily as important but mm-hmm. yeah I, I for me i think bluegill if you're talking bluegill or a jerk bait you know if you've seen bluegills guys and this is again my personal belief they're very they don't move very fast they're chill and they're used to being around bass versus a shad mm-hmm. or a minnow they see it they're getting out of there mm-hmm. a bluegill's not and so i feel like if you're mm-hmm. really if they're really dialed in on bluegill they'll get close to them before they eat them because mm-hmm. a bluegill usually isn't freaking out by them right. so i do think with bluegill depending on the time of year matching it will give you a few extra bites right. because their relationship is way different than if they're mm-hmm. if they're feeding on shad or blueback herring. Mm-hmm. And that think, goes back to we were talking too about we've talked about this before and just profile and yeah. shape and stuff mm-hmm. and then but you know it's kind of like crayfish too. Crayfish will go through different molds yes. of different, you know, colors. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, it's not to say that color doesn't matter because it it does, it changes. Um but so it's a combination of the two, the profile mm-hmm. and and the color. It's yeah. somewhere in there and then the action. And so there is not to throw it totally out the window and say it doesn't matter. It just depends on, yeah. on I guess mm-hmm. you and if you really want to go down that right. rabbit hole or not. Right. But you don't have to join me on you that, dark, simple, on that yeah. dark side. The bluegill spawn, I think, predominantly plays mm. in the, that color, that fine tuning of the color. Oh, mm-hmm. yeah. When the bass are actively mm. seeking out the bluegill in beds, then right. I'll kind of like take a step back and I'm mm. like, maybe I'll take a trout rod today and try to catch one of these just mm-hmm. to see what it looks like, throw it back and then maybe fine tune a little bit. But mm-hmm. I mean, if you take a green pumpkin jig and you buy a green pumpkin trailer, a green pumpkin red, a green pumpkin gold, a green pumpkin blue, mm-hmm. you got six different colors mm-hmm. of jigs at this point or however many. You can, you can change yeah. the whole profile and the yeah. whole color of a jig just yeah. by the trailer you put on it. Well, that's, I'm going to go to that next too, because trailer, and I'm the kind of guy too that uh, and we talked before, like bait shop, you come in here and there's, you know, literally 15, 20 different uh, styles of trailers mm-hmm. and then don't even get into colors because it's, and I'll never forget when dad first started, when he first opened this thing and trying to think, okay, what are we going to carry? I'm not talking early on the first two mm-hmm. weeks, you know, I opened up a Bass Pro catalog back in the catalog days even. And it was like, well, that'll be easy, right? But no, because you got all the different weights. Okay, your sizes. Then you, you get into colors. Like me that come in here, asking, yeah, like, and do you, you got have colors, and you start looking at the color scheme, and it's like, holy smokes! Like yeah. this is not so easy. But anyway, the that idea. Um, but I'm the kind of guy too, kind of like that. I'll try. I have my favorites, but I'll try it because you know we have eight or ten different ones. Well, let me try this one. Let me try that one, and I'll switch them out. Mm-hmm. And I don't know that I ever <laughs> found that one's better than the other. You can kind of catch them on all of them. Um, and it goes back to confidence. What is, what you're confident in is what works for you, which may be different for somebody yeah. else, but it is still to be said that you've had this subtle, you have a subtle flap, you have more of a kicking action, you have your, you know, your swim paddle tail style. So yeah. What are you speak to trailers? What right. are you considering? Oh, uh, any more. Uh, I've <laughs> noticed that like, seems like everybody that brings out a creature style bait or mm-hmm. a crawl style bait most of them seem to have an appendage that that flaps right. somehow some way so it seems like everything on the market anymore that people are buying whether it be the bandito bug from guggen or mm-hmm. the the rage bug from strike king right. or the z crawls or the speed crawls mm-hmm. they're all like these like trailers that just they, they have so much action mm-hmm. and if the water's cold or if it's a super heavy pressured mm-hmm. lake or you know whatever you know conditions dictate sometimes they want that action mm-hmm. But the old school chunks seem so long just forgotten subtle, about. Yeah. Just that subtleness. I mean, they mm-hmm. still have a little flap. Like this, this is a Berkeley chunk, and it's got these like little bulbs all over it. So mm-hmm. it'll still move, but mm-hmm. it just doesn't move as much. Mm-hmm. And that's big, like tournament fishing. Like we said earlier, fishing behind somebody. Mm-hmm. If they're throwing something with a speed crawl on it, and you come behind them with this, oh. you're going to get bites. Yeah. Um, but I mean, like swim jigs, obviously, like you, you need to have something that flaps. And 
I'd say 90% of the time I'm throwing a crawl style trailer on a swim jig. Mm -hmm. uh, the paddle tails get bites more so I'd say if you're fishing open water, which I don't know why you'd be throwing a swim jig around open water, but if you do and that's your thing, then you know, you, you want a, something with a, like a swim bait on the back of it. Mm -hmm. But most of the time I'm fishing grass. Now, granted, I don't know how many chartreuse and white crawfish are out there, but that, that crawl trailer just seems to get me more bites. Mm -hmm. I don't know if it's size profile, what it is, mm -hmm. But it seems like they don't short strike it as much with crawl trailers and swim baits. Um, anytime I'm flipping a jig, I like chunks. If the water is warm or if I'm fishing around like bluegill beds and stuff, I like a trailer that flaps a little bit more just because, you know, bait fish gets mm. a little tail action and stuff. But if they're really dialed into crawfish, like there's, there's no crawfish out there swimming with its claws. Like mm, it's right. got that subtle action. So that's where I'll opt for a chunk or something. Mm. If I'm fishing rock and cold water and wood, and there's a lot of crawfish in the area. I'll, I'll tend to gravitate towards that more. Mm. So let and, me throw in real quick too. For those that don't know, uncle Josh is back on the market. I know oh, wow. it went away for a, a good while. It was a shortage of pork or something. I don't they know. They couldn't People find the too right much bacon uh, or something. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, anyway, it's back. It's back. We went to ICAST last year and it's back. And we've got a few in there. And of course, they got all the different numbers and everything. Of course, mm -hmm. and that was, that's that's a hot item too oh, yeah. because it's in that solution. It's it's real. And it's something about when they grab on that too, they, they won't let, let it go. go. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's one thing to get the bite. It's another thing for them to be swimming away with it. Yeah. You know what I mean? So you get that good cracking yeah. hook set on. Yeah, so just throwing that out there as well. But yeah, I think uh, that's definitely a void that needed to be filled again. Because mm -hmm. we, I know me personally, I was seeking out like small people on eBay trying to buy mm -hmm. these things. They're like fifteen dollars for like mm -hmm. two or three of them. It was stupid. But the durability you get with pork is nice, mm -hmm. uh, and it seems like cold water is the mm -hmm. ticket for those. Now, are you just going out? Just I know cutting it down or sizing it past your skirt where what are you looking for just slightly past it or oh it depends like if i want a bigger full profile i'll leave the skirt long like mm -hmm. this one yeah it's like probably an inch past the bend of the hook but with the the living rubber i have a couple jigs especially finesse jigs and stuff where i'll leave it longer than the silicone because it's going to float up mm -hmm. And it just gives them something else to look at, I think. Mm -hmm. And it's always like my off color. So like this is basically a black jig, but it's just got blue living rubber in it just to kind of offset it a little bit. Mm -hmm. But I like to leave that long. Um, if it's a flipping jig or something, I like it as close and tight to the hook as possible. I don't have a good example here, but uh, I'll pinch the skirt to where it's all tight together and I'll make an angled cut. So I'll cut one side up towards the barb of the hook and I'll cut the back side up towards the head of the hook. It'll give it a little more flair and action. And it also, you know, you left the middle of that skirt long, so it's still hiding your hook mm -hmm. to an extent. But it's just like a V cut. So if I was going to cut this one, I'd pinch it all flat and I'd cut this way with the scissors and I would cut this way with the scissors. That way the back and the front flares more. Interesting. And a point that, 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 that he made, guys, these are not hard and fast rules with anything we're talking about. So if you're going out with a pitching jig because you listen to the show, like you're pitching docks, please do not then just skip the area in between and not swim it. Is it perfect? No, but it might clue you in on an adjustment. The same mm -hmm. thing, if I have a swim jig and I'm swimming some grass, but I see a stick up log, I'm not gonna pass it up because I have a, I'll throw it there and see if I get a reaction. From there, I can make adjustments from there. Because that's what's so nice about the jig is you can do both. You can work a vertical target mm -hmm. and then swim it. And then based on what the fish say, you can make those Some adjustments. Some of our best success on Anna has been like you're fishing, everybody, we fish docks, but mm -hmm. there's, there's places between the docks. I mean, throw a jig out. I've had, we had a one yeah. particular day, just they, they weren't, they might've been on the docks, but we were catching them in between the docks yeah. in no man's land and just, you know the jig bite was like you're saying it was on that's mm -hmm. what was working and so it almost got to be where you didn't even worry about it you got past the docks and we were fishing between mm -hmm. the docks. yeah know, i can't explain why but that's where they were and so. john john cox last last year <clears throat> when he won a big tournament everyone is fishing like blue back bites and he's just taking this big ugly jig mm -hmm. and he's swimming it flipping it he's doing it every which mm -hmm. way and catching them and mm -hmm. so it's a really cool bait that is very no matter which style you go with you can try to do multiple things mm -hmm. with it don't mentally lock yourself in that if it's a flipping jig you can only flip with it try something else with it and then make adjustments from there well that's a long forgotten uh i guess like head style would be an mm -hmm. arky jig yeah, yeah. yeah. the I arky like was the perfect all-around jig mm -hmm. it's a flipping jig it's a swim that's jig. Right. you can skip it nobody makes an arky style head anymore mm -hmm. but you can take that arky you can put a you know a, a trailer on it that has some action you mm -hmm. can flip it you can throw it as mm -hmm. a swim jig and do mm -hmm. everything with mm -hmm. it 
And I, I'd honestly really like to see a company come back out with an Archie style head, just mm. old schools can be. Yeah. That way we can have that versatility mm. again, rather than I need a brush jig, I need a swim jig, I need a football mm. head. She can do all that with an Archie. Yeah, that's what Roger's tying his buck hair uh, jigs, uh, hair jigs on an Archie head. And you're right, it, that is a good, good style. It's awesome. Mm -hmm. Anything else on the actual base before we move on to body water i, th I go oh, you're down that rabbit hole i strong, know i ladies. really am i just uh, okay fine and, and it's interesting the tails. though like because and we were talking earlier and chris and i are kind of the same in fact we don't we try not to overthink and that's easy to do yeah but you've heard me say before like i agree basic colors just try to try as best you can to keep it simple mm -hmm. um, but to your point it's we're all made different yeah. we all think differently and there's a place for you know the details mm -hmm. and um and it's upbringing too because like you know some of the places i grew up fishing they got pounded like i went to school at shenandoah there were some years all i fished was jim Brown park and mm -hmm. if i wanted to get bit it's it's what is the difference thing mm -hmm. there and so if you're on super duper heavy pressured things or if you're a big bait guy that likes to go after them you know the fish of a lifetime that's where i think those rabbit holes are affected because if you're after a 10 pounder or a six pound smallmouth that thing's not stupid mm -hmm. and it will analyze it. Like, mm -hmm. and I think a, a spot in a small mouth in clear water where in their habitat, those guys are smart. They're as smart as a muskie. And you got to think like, what is it my action? Or is there something else that he's looking at? He's like, I've, I've seen this jig twice already. Like, cause I mean, if you get that big, they've been stuck before. Well, I think my personal opinion too, and I agree with you, I like a jig and I, and the idea of a jig, you're fishing a jig on the bottom. Mm -hmm. And I think when I believe that fish, uh, when they're searching and hunting, they'll, they'll go out and cruise. And if, you know, if they're chasing that bait ball or whatever, mm -hmm. but I think once they're fed up, I, I don't think they're not out there, you know, wasting a bunch of energy. They get to the bottom and they slam to the bottom and they're going to chill. Mm -hmm. Um, so I think by dragging a jig, I think that strike zone on that bottom part of the water column, you'll tend to catch bigger fish. Yeah. Um, because I think you're bringing it by them I and the crayfish are living down there too. Mm -hmm. So you'll still have those fish swimming around there but you also have the crayfish that aren't probably going to be in the middle or upper part of the column they're going to be down so i just think that bigger fish will come and it can be river pond lake whatever but uh, i think it is there's something to that and i think it is yeah. like I say i think because after they fed up those, <coughs> those feeding windows too there's not there might be 10 yeah. 15 minutes and you might only get you know i don't know i don't know four or five a day or whatever every that's why you, you they go no you're not catching anything for mm -hmm. an hour hour and a half you know then all of a sudden bam 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 but during those times, I think you're going to find them on the bottom. Now, I, I just Personal think bigger opinion. fish and like really what I think Matt Allen talked about this with his <clears throat> swim bait system. They're not if, if they don't see you, they will analyze a bait forever. And if you're dealing with a swim bait or a jerk bear thing, I think we'd be shocked if we could like see through the water that the bigger ones. It's not like they randomly run up on it. That sometimes happens. But I think they mm -hmm. do watch a bait a lot more than we give them credit mm -hmm. for. Because they can feel it when it's in their territory, mm -hmm. whether it's a jerk bait or something. I mean, that's just my, like the little ones, I think, react more because they're afraid the bigger one's going to take it mm -hmm. away from them. But I think the biggest ones in the area, I think we'd be shocked at how much heartbreak we'd have that they've stared at that thing a lot before they actually, they commit to it. But that's just my. my Tying that back to jig fishing, I think a lot of people overwork a jig. Like there's a lot of times uh, we were actually uh, me and my friend were having a conversation the other day about uh, flipping at the Lower Potomac. He had a tournament where the guy that was on the front of his boat, they were both punching, and the guy on the front of the boat would punch a hole and sit there and three or four times he's you know he's putting action whatever on the bait, not getting bites. He would pitch in and just soak it and just let it set three, four, five seconds, and then just reel it out of the hole. Hmm. If he didn't get a bite, but more so than not, he was getting bites and the guy that was mm -hmm. overworking the bait wasn't. Mm -hmm. And like you just said, if they're analyzing a bait, no matter if you're on a lake or river or what, that's why I really like the living rubber is it floats and it undulates and yeah. it looks like it's alive. So if this is just sitting on the bottom, this is floating up and there's there's some kind of water movement somehow, some way, and it's just moving and that fish is analyzing and it's looking at it and it's like, all right, well, that it's moving, that's alive. All right, five, ten seconds later, I've looked at it enough. I'm going to eat it. So instead of just, you know, pitching a jig and just giving it three or four bounces and reeling it in, just let it set for a little bit. And I would challenge people, too. To, what makes me think, then, too, is <clears throat> sometimes instead of thinking about the fish, think about the forage. So, like, yes. a crayfish. <clears throat> and so, how are they responding? How are they reacting? And so, mm -hmm. like, a crayfish, whether they're walking around or we see them give them a defensive position versus if they're swimming away and they get kind of streamlined. That's why, like, even a crankbait that looks 
you know, like this. That's how that crayfish, whether he's in this position or is going to go into this position, starts swimming yeah, when away. He pulls away. And it's pulling away. Mm -hmm. But also, the other thing that I think is huge is when they're, if they're going across the bottom, a natural setting where that thing is going across the bottom and it's kicking up dust or dirt or whatever and cranking off the rocks and stuff. That, and, that, and that's what you're mimicking. And mm -hmm. so it, that makes me think, too, you got the technique you're talking about, the let it soak, but you also have the drag. Yeah. You know, Everybody the, the likes drag, to bounce a jig. Bounce or a drag. That's gonna be Nobody a drag likes that. to drag a jig. <clears throat> Correct. It's and not so, pretty. Nobody likes to do it. Yeah. It's not pretty. Right. You like to snap it off and get that good bite and that good yes. jarring hook set. But I've heard guys, too, like um, on a, I was talking about the buck hair jig, too, the hair jig with the little, just a small little trailer, mm -hmm. right? And like you're saying, how many times, and this doesn't happen often, and, and most people don't fish it this way, but like you're saying, you're bringing it back in, and they've, he's had days where it's just like on mm -hmm. the retrieval, and that thing's just, you know, and they're just attacking it. So, again, going back and trying different things, different yeah. techniques, and see fish what the fish want. Yeah. yeah, give them what they want. Yeah, don't just listen that, like, you have to burn a crankbait, mm -hmm. and that's it. Right. And, like, yeah. You never try any other retrieve, because mm -hmm. it takes you five seconds to make that adjustment. Mm -hmm. And that was one thing when I would do knowledge, and, like, I've told you this story before we switch subjects. Like, I read a bass message about fishing swim baits, and this was back when the Bass Tricks came out. Like, oh, my God, this is so cool. So I went out, I bought a six-inch swim bait i went to a farm i was like oh this fucking suck like, i'm not catching anything why is this not working well because that was specific for like gunnersville and all these mm -hmm. other places and you didn't realize like oh i need to tailor it for here mm -hmm. and then i need to make adjustments in the retrieve they're saying mm -hmm. oh you got to burn it and do this and that you know experiment don't take something that you hear here or anywhere for gospel take that information and then make adjustments with what you see right what works for you Let's go into a lake. Or go ahead. Oh, go ahead. Fin no, finish up with us. Okay. No, yeah, yeah. It was like you were saying earlier with Aaron Martins. When he passed, you know, there was like a thousand stories of like, just, you know, reliving his life. Mm -hmm. I don't remember who it was, but it, I read a story about they were pre-fishing a tournament in the early 2000s at Lake Havasu. And Martins took a pair of goggles and a snorkel and threw yes. a pair to this guy. And he swam yep. down just to see how the fish were acting that day yep. to tell yeah. how he was going to fish that. That's right. So it's all, it's not about what you like. It's about what the fish yep. want. Right. What's natural the to them. Mm -hmm. Yep. Very good. Let's go to a body of water, uh, Raystown Lake. All right. Uh, how far north from where we sit right now in Winchester? Probably about <clears throat> two hours and 15 minutes from here. Okay. Uh, Berkeley County, West Virginia, it's like an hour 38. Mm -hmm. uh, same distance pretty much to the lower Potomac from here than mm -hmm. it is there. And it's pretty overlooked, I'd say. Mm -hmm. It's a big pleasure boat and lake. That's, mm -hmm. It's probably it's one downside in the summertime. be busy in the summertime. Well, real busy. You yeah. got about the first two, three hours of daylight and then right before dark. And mm -hmm. But it's also that, out in the middle of like nowhere. nowhere. Mm -hmm. Like Just show up and there's a lake. Yeah. It's kind of like the uh, Field of Dreams. Yeah. Is that right? <laughs> yeah. Because you're just driving pretty it's uh, if you've ever been to like jennings randolph or mm -hmm. someplace like yep. that yep just driving through nowhere and then all of a sudden it's like there's oh there, a, there's mm -hmm. the lake there it is yeah. yeah but it's uh good smallmouth lake from what i understand that's you know i've only <clears> ever <throat> went up in largemouth fish okay i have right, nice. I, it's just easy because mm -hmm. you go up and you find these big grass flats, uh, flats with bluegill and shad and stuff all over them and largemouth are loaded up on it okay Smallmouth in, in a lake like that's where it's deep and it's big they just travel and they move and they follow the bait and it's mm -hmm. just harder to get on that pattern gotcha but if you go and find a grass flat, there's there's largemouth. Mm -hmm. um, now I know a lot of guys that go up and chase a smallmouth, and that's mm -hmm. that's your one in bag. If you're tournament fishing, or if you want to go up and catch a lot of big fish at Racetown, mm -hmm. dial it in. Go find a ball of bait with some fish behind it, and mm -hmm. see if you can catch a smallmouth or something. You know, make sure it's not a striper because right. there's a lot of them in there. But the the smallmouth fishing is your 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 biggest bags. Granted, mm -hmm. there's somebody just called an eight pound largemouth up there. Good I think Lord. you guys posted it on your Facebook okay. a little mm -hmm. while back. So the big ones are there, mm -hmm. but the the general consensus of the biggest bags in the lake are smallmouth. Mm -hmm. If you want a twenty plus pound bag, you're you're smallmouth fishing. Mm -hmm. What's the average weight there to cash a check? Depends on or guesstimate. Like, is it like if it's a tournament with locals in it, you're going to need twenty pounds. Damn. Yeah, that's if, impressive. Every club I've ever seen a fish in, if you got fourteen pounds, you probably won between 20, uh, ten and thirteen. I'd say, but just with people with with little knowledge, because you're. You're fishing your strengths at that point. Mm -hmm. I haven't seen the lake in a couple of years, and hopefully today when we set this club schedule, we're going back. Mm -hmm. I'm going largemouth fishing just because I know that I have spots up there that I can go that'll produce between 10 to 15 pounds, and I'll probably finish first, second, or third in the club because mm -hmm. I know that's what everybody else is doing. Mm -hmm. But if I was fishing a tournament up there with like local pressure, you're just going to have to go find smallmouth. That's all there is to it. Mm -hmm. With that place, um, I went up there just one time, and that's the one thing I noticed was the grass and everything. But it doesn't have a lot of massive creek arms like a Smith Mountain Lake or something like that. Um, it's very narrow. So does that really 
put the fishing pressure in some specific spots. I'm thinking like in a pre-spawn spawn tournament, it's got to be the pressure's got to be insane because there's only a few places there compared to the summertime. Like, how do you approach that when um, you go there? For anybody that's listening, that's fished uh, Jennings Randolph or fished um, the Yakagani Reservoir mm -hmm. or anything like that, it's it's the Juniata River dammed up, so it, it's a flooded river system. And if you look at a map, the whole lake is just bends and turns, just like the river was. Gotcha. So main lake points i think would play uh big time but for pre-spawn and stuff i mean like you said there's only a couple of arms in it mm. and they're mostly down lake so if you got to the back of that you're gonna be a lot of boats sitting there so i'd either probably look for the fish that haven't pushed all the way up or if if there is a lot of boats if not you know obviously i want to go fish my strengths and try to catch those pre-spawners but i'd say honestly good electronics side scan down scan find a school of fish try to catch them main lake points secondary points there's not many of those either uh, that would probably be the the first approach. If not, if I'm not getting bites that way, I'm definitely going to bail and I'm just going to have to fish behind people mm -hmm. and fish that, that shallow bite. And it's a really cool lake, though. It, it is. I've never really been up neat. there. I hear a lot about it when we know we've had some customers go up there. Yeah, lake but, trout, muskies, <clears throat> stripers, smallmouth, largemouth. There's all kinds of stuff in that lake. Mm -hmm. yeah, flooded think, city yeah. up there. Really? Mm -hmm. yeah, I guess one of the old towns that they, they evacuated everybody out of before they flooded it. Huh. It's down towards the dam. I didn't know that. Mm -hmm. So because it is a pleasure lake too, what what uh, month would you maybe avoid going up there? June, July, up, August, cool. September. Okay. Yeah, pretty much. If there's, if your <laughs> local water has pleasure boat traffic, mm -hmm. Brakestown has pleasure has boat traffic because they actually have lake houses and or yeah, uh, not really houses lake but boats. lake boats yeah. or house boats mm -hmm. and stuff house up boats, there. Yeah. You'd be going down the river and there comes somebody and you see them cooking breakfast in their boat and you're like oh, that's neat <laughs> i go for that that's a place i want to go back to the other place i went to the first time ever was deep creek actually last uh, okay. last summer yeah. um that is interesting there because mm. of the amount of pressure and people like i was shocked at mm. how many people are actually there in the summertime have you ever been to deep creek before? i have not but mr bass was up there last year okay and a guy from martinsburg actually wanted uh charlie rustler because would that be part of your club's area yeah uh, western okay. maryland okay uh, cool hey I mean, we'll travel outside <clears throat> of that hopefully i'm suggesting anna because i love lake anna mm -hmm. like, it's probably one of my i grew up fishing down there mm -hmm. that was like my travel spot to go fishing mm -hmm. but uh deep creek probably be on the list this year and not seeing it but just looking at it on the maps and stuff and you know from friends that have fished it mm -hmm. that docks played big up there from yeah. right here mm -hmm. docks and grass yeah, yeah. The other two places, um, let's just ruin another place that I'm going to get death threats on. Little Pool and Big Pool. One, people care about because no one wants to talk about it. Uh -huh. The other one. I'm reluctant to talk about it. <laughs> yeah, but um, <clears throat> it's it's really easy. You can't put a boat in there. It's it's really hard. But if you want to get a kid fishing, I would suggest going there. Um, but Big Pool, it should be about 80 acres. It has the potential. We talked about that beforehand. We'll be a little confrontational. How badly has Maryland Fishing Game messed up that place? They've like, ruined it completely. Maryland fishing game has dropped the ball completely on what probably was you throw Boyd's and, you know, send little Seneca Lake, whatever you want to call it, throw that completely out the window because that's a big fish lake. Big pool had potential to be the best lake in Maryland at one point. Wow. I'll just go out on a limb and say that, uh, you know, from friends that I've had that have fished it their whole life. Like that was the lake in Western Maryland. The poor management has completely ruined it. In what way? They're apparently the story that we get because they have park rangers because it's Fort Frederick State Park. So the story that we always get why it's so low now is there's a hole in the dam. Fix the hole. Let's get water <laughs> back in this thing. Mm -hmm. You had 88 acres of fishable water at one point. Mm. Why are we down to like 55, mm. 60 acres of water maybe? Gotcha. Even when we have a good rain or like a, you know, if the river's blown out because we got like, what, a foot of water in yeah. like a, a week, that lake is still low. It'll get muddy, but wow. it just doesn't like hold water hmm. and i think it has taken all the dissolved oxygen not all of it but the okay. majority of like yeah. the good dissolved oxygen especially later <clears throat> in the summertime when that lake is 80 mm -hmm. 90 degrees the fish aren't doing anything and i think two years ago there was like a, a, a small fish kill up there that mm -hmm. killed all the bait like there was a lot of big crappies you know uh, yellow perch bluegill and it seemed like it, it hit the bait fish harder than anything but the bass population is just not there anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, there was days you'd go up, even in the wintertime, water temperature would be 38 degrees. You throw a tube or a jig and then around them rocks, you catch 30, 40 fish. You go and catch five in a day now, you did something. It's hmm. just such a poorly managed lake. And that's the common general consensus with all the lakes in the area is it's it's so poorly managed. 
there's no grass in the lake. But if you want, you know, the stuff that your your bait eats to have, yeah. you know, a forage, put the water level back up to where it's in the trees and stuff and give this plankton and stuff right. something to hang on to, something to, to be around. Yeah. Right. Have you ever been there before? I have not. No. So it, it honestly is like if you took like a table rock type of thing and you drained it down, there's tons of different rock of different size. And you can see this tree line where there's just a massive amount of like old, like brush and shrubs and stuff. And it, you look like this. If this is at full water pool, it would be the greatest place on the planet to just flip. You could just flip all day long, all day long. Hmm. And it is a really, really neat little fishery. And it's it's a shame because I first time I went there, I was like, dude, if this thing w went up to those trees, I mean, this place would be a freaking amazing. And it used to be that way. And it used to be up in the trees. And there's like the last good day I ever had up there. I was telling him earlier, I caught I had like 15 pounds from my best five. I caught seven fish all day. But there was these like nasty shrubs that grew in the water. Mm. And it was just a big line of like, I don't even know what they were. They were just like nasty little shrubs, but a spinnerbait would come right through them. And that's how I called all my fish up. They were fishing that stuff. Cool. And it was the best. Yeah. But it was the it was the best lake in the area for just meat and potatoes fishing. Mm -hmm. Chatterbait, crankbait, jig, Carolina rig. Just stuff that you like are hard pressed to fish anywhere else. You could go there and, and like act, have a fun day of jig fishing. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. But it's just gone now it's, it's sad mm. it's really sad because mm. these are places that we have to like have our license to do it and i i can see i know that the government area they're trying their best but there is a disconnect and hopefully this podcast helps with this with mm. opening up communication it's like where's our money going and how can we get mm. all on the same page here because we could have better fisheries and you talked about was it seneca yeah uh, black black hills seneca black lake hills? whatever you want to call it okay. uh, they call it boyd's reservoir okay it's uh on close to frederick okay and it's kind of sets up like Lake Frederick when Lake Frederick had grass in it. Mm -hmm. It's almost identical, but you can power fish up there. Mm -hmm. and, you know, it's 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 nice. I was actually I didn't realize my club had a website until this morning. <laughs> uh, God won a tournament with like three fish up there last year, and you had like eight. Uh, it was an eight and a five and like Whoa. something else. Yeah, that was his mm -hmm. bag. So he had like sixteen, seventeen pounds, but he only had three fish. That's what is the club yeah. at you? Uh, Antietam Bassmasters. Okay, mm -hmm. um, from my understanding. It's the oldest Bassmaster affiliated club in Maryland now. Oh, that's pretty cool. I think they started in like 1992. So before I was a twinkle, they were a, a bass club. Oh, that's, that's pretty so awesome. Cool. That is yeah. cool. Yeah. So you, and, got any, you got any questions or anything? Uh, yeah, just, <laughs> well, I mean, back to what you were saying, I think that is something we'll eventually want to get into is, and I don't care what state you're in, like, mm -hmm. you know, so, and it is hard. Like you say, there's so much water um, and you only have so many resources. But yeah. in saying that, outdoorsmen, I mean, we pump a bunch of money into, you know, with licenses. And so where does that, <clears throat> you know, we were talking like in Virginia or anywhere. You got trout, yeah. you got your trout yeah. anglers, you know, you got your river guys, you got your lake guys. And so trying to, you know, delegate those resources and money and funding. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, like you're talking about the dam I mean, that's not an easy fix. It's not a cheap fix, but your point it's it's a resource and mm -hmm. it's a body of water and so you got to find a way to somehow bridge that gap too between the angler the end user you know and yeah. the biologist and and what is the best you know or the recreational person mm -hmm. too that's the other big challenge a lot of times you hear about uh they're just strictly in there for the recreation and could care less about the fish the fishery so you know that is a challenge that's something it again is. like you say maybe this this platform would be a way that we can bridge those gaps and and try to you know get you know voice heard and just and, establish a communication <clears throat> like right, let's open the, talk. the yeah open yeah. the communication and i'm completely you. biased like i'm yeah, sure absolutely saying that yeah. i'm a bass fisherman that's right i could i won't say i could care less about because i like to see you know if you're a trout fisherman great you're in the industry you, mm -hmm. you you love it that's your thing cool right but it seems like it's just a super like it seems like they get catered to so much right like, i think maryland stocked was it three hundred thousand trout or west virginia one of the two mm -hmm. states last year stocked mm -hmm. that many trout they put in fifteen thousand bass mm -hmm. is it because they're that much harder to raise mm -hmm. is it give us a feedback of why they like we're no, not getting yeah. anything in return yeah. and then the river system we, one thing we talked about is because of the river system the flooding and it's just mm -hmm. it's hard for uh, they get those recruitment classes each year, you know, you get a flood at the wrong time and it just completely washes out that class of fish. And so again, just trying to, you know, with a stocking program to be able to replenish that, you know, that resource. Yeah. Uh, cause to your point, yeah, there's the, the bass guys yeah. are yeah. pretty big and strong. And as far as, uh, desire to, um, I, I'd, I'd be curious to see that proportion of, of mm -hmm. licensure. Mm -hmm. Um, well, not only that, look, 
look at all this. Yeah, right. I mean, yeah. How much money do we spend? <clears throat> yeah. How much do we attribute to the economy? Correct. And I forgot my notebook, like a dummy, but I had it broke down to where, like, I think the average angler, like, if you look, a bass angler, boat, truck, tackle, oh, the yeah. whole nine. I don't even want to hear it. Yeah. I don't it's ridiculous <laughs> the amount of money we spend. Yeah. As opposed to a trout guy mm -hmm. who has a four foot ugly stick <clears throat> and, like, right that's their thing and they love it but we contribute more to the economy mm -hmm. and we travel because mm -hmm. i've been from racetown to wheeler lake mm -hmm. in alabama bass mm -hmm. fishing mm -hmm. that attributed to motels hotels gas mm -hmm. trucks mm -hmm. you know boat the whole nine like mm -hmm. i had to attribute to the economy mm -hmm. in other ways outside of fishing you know it might even i was just thinking because i uh worked did a uh duck license for a guy yesterday or waterfowl license mm -hmm. basically but you know you see on there all the time about an extra 10 bucks or something the conservation conservation yep. so that might be something too because i know like up at a private lake for us like we we put a lot of money towards oh, stocking yeah. like our own money so <laughs> mm -hmm. right so and i think and we were talking about smith mountain same thing when that guy put the the uh the florida strain bass in there like a lot of people are putting up their own money to be able to stock well i guarantee and if you did that if you did like a donation yeah. type oh, thing yeah. if you ask an open poll how much mm -hmm. money you could pour in hey bass fisherman um, can you chip in can you help us out 20 dollars yeah. a person can we put a pool together to yeah. you know get and we i guarantee crazy. people would yeah. be like yeah i'm all for that yeah, yeah. where's that money going when they say that it's conservation <clears throat> i think we talk about the communication and transparency mm -hmm. and i think with bass anglers are very we we don't like to talk like mm -hmm. in the right way like when we started this and i i i mentioned it like i have two two specials coming out with konica jig and also little pool and i, I i'm not lying like i had people that were insanely pissed about that <clears throat> we're very tight-lipped and i think the trout family the trout people they might be smaller but they're more vocal it's more prestigious mm -hmm. we don't band together and communicate like this is wrong we are paying the budget here mm -hmm. let's Let's sit down and figure mm -hmm. this out. Well, and also I think too, but I think it goes back to too, like how can we help? Well, yes. I do know about trout guys too. I love our, our Winchester Trout Unlimited. I get their mm -hmm. publication. I love reading mm -hmm. that thing every time because they're literally on the ground uh, moving rocks, you yeah. Know, yeah. building, mm -hmm. yeah. you know, habit building that, you know, V or, you know, cut for the fish to be able to, mm -hmm. you know, live. And so they're, they're not just, um, they're doing a <clears throat> hatchery program in the schools, right? So they're, um they're helping they're helping with the problem yeah right? they they're not they just are. out here yeah complaining about it yeah. they're actually mm -hmm. boots on the ground helping solve a problem mm -hmm. so maybe that's something too that can yeah definitely be taken Absolutely. away from it like you're saying mm -hmm. and let's and let's put our money where our mouth is or let's put our action because i'm more uh, than willing to <clears throat> just go out and do stuff to help like um, like yeah. they do it I, I, we yeah. keep coming back no, to frederick right. but greg no, and all these christmas yeah. trees that that's he plants right. every year up yeah. there that there's just a donation pile. That's drop right. your Christmas tree off. We're making fish structures today. That's right. And Can that, we do that elsewhere? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> because see, and that's what they're doing. That's and talking to Jason. That's the, mm -hmm. that was the joint effort um, to make that happen. And <clears throat> and Greg was a huge part of that, you know. And then the state came in behind, was able to just take what was already done, the legwork, and <clears throat> drop them in. So and also with Jason, I mean, because I, I think this is a good topic, and, <clears throat> and a lot of people. I think are interested in this. Like, why is it you're not stocking the lower end of the food chain? Why aren't you stocking mm -hmm. shiners and minnows? Why aren't you doing crayfish? Why aren't you doing shad? Other states do it. So there's, I don't think the cop-out answer is there for that. When mm -hmm. you look at Texas and, and Tennessee and all these other fish hatchery places that do a very good job making sure the base part of the food chain is intact. Mm -hmm. You say like, oh, there's too much predators. Well, maybe it's not getting rid of the predators. Maybe you just need to help with making mm -hmm. sure we have suckers. Cause I knew they were talking about like bow hunters and doing stuff with like the sucker population. Well, let's, can we fix that? Mm -hmm. Can we fix that there mm -hmm. and talk to us about what we can do? If you can't do it, allow us to do it. Right. Let us to do it. Um, and, the, and the last part that was interesting was when we had Mike on, Mike runs the Norm Virginia Kayak Association. Mm -hmm. And it, you're not allowed to have tournaments on certain waters, like state, like Lake Frederick, you can't. Mm -hmm. Why? Why can't you have tournaments? And then a portion of the tournament goes towards the mm -hmm. government to help restock these places mm -hmm. like that like that's why the bass masters go to lake fork presented by mm -hmm. the texas fish and game right. to help raise money this makes no sense that you're saying you don't want us to have tournaments to highlight the place that you run mm -hmm. that you're taking care of like mm -hmm. does that make sense to anyone here why we can't right. do that like i don't know and i think maryland actually the one thing they do well is you can't have tournaments until after june 15th mm -hmm. after mm -hmm. spawning season is completely over with keep mm -hmm. that pressure off the, i mean you can still mm -hmm. fish for them but they have to. There's there's no yeah. tournament pressure Correct. in the whole state until June 15th. Mm -hmm. 
which is nice. That's that's a step in the right direction. Right. But like you said, like we need to do something to get bait back in the water because if you have, you know, smallmouth like the Upper Potomac, just as an example, you have smallmouth, largemouth, walleye that get supplementally stocked, muskies that get supplementally stocked, mm -hmm. channel cats, now flatheads. Mm, that's oof. <laughs> oh, yeah. We're really old in a can of worms now. <laughs> yeah. But you have all these predatory species that don't have enough to eat, so they're going to resort into yep. eating each That's other. A good point. Why can't we just mm -hmm. give them something to eat? Because I know the sucker population is definitely hurting. Oh, we yeah. used to be able to go to the river and see like green stone roller suckers and yellow mm -hmm. suckers everywhere. I haven't seen a sucker on the river in years. Mm -hmm. Probably it's probably been at least four or five years since I've seen one. Mm. So why can't we do anything? To help those fish populations, are they just because they're not a, a glamorous fish? Do we just not care about them? But it's a it's a vital role in the ecosystem. I still think. I mean, I think uh, I know the word bureaucracy came up <clears throat> in one of the podcasts, and I think. And but I think also, and we saw this at again a private lake that I'm part of. Uh, we just sometimes we we're not like you said. We're not vocal enough. We're not mm -hmm. vocal enough, but we're also we're vocal in the wrong ways. Where we'll, all we'll do is complain about it, mm -hmm. and we don't want to look at positive ways that how, how can we help yeah you know and so that's something that's something to think about yeah for sure and i'm sure there's more than enough people out there <clears throat> willing to donate like a saturday to mm -hmm. all right well we'll go stock fish today mm -hmm. or we'll go yeah. help at the hatchery or mm -hmm. we'll donate money to, donate, yeah. to put help. money in to help with that stocking yeah and allow us to do this privately mm -hmm. like i knew yeah. there was some backlash when when the people down in james river and the rappahannock did what they did Mm -hmm. And there's backlash from the government for doing it because it was private. But mm -hmm. on the same token, now look at where we are. And it was a right call. Let people do things like that. Because you can't say like, well, there might be an invasive species, but we're going to go put this apex predator from the Minnesota in our rivers. Right. And that's fine if we do that. But if we want to stock shad or something like that to give our estuaries a place, please make an argument to why what you do is correct. But when we do the exact same thing, that's wrong. Right. Like. No, that's that. right. And I think what McCotter, we need to bring, you know, McCotter back on too, because he talked about, yeah. I'm dying to hear about the, you know, Chickahominy story and how, what they did to bring that back and mm -hmm. make it into a fishery it is today, you know? So, uh, no, it's something definitely to, to, yeah. to think about. And I think, again, this could be a platform we could bridge those guys. I, I really hope so. I is really there anything so. else in Maryland that you'd like to fish that want to talk about? Yeah. Maryland waters? Maryland, yeah. Pennsylvania, or even West Virginia for that matter? South Branch of West Virginia is All right, pretty talk overlooked. A bit about that. It's it's a great fishery. Where are we talking? Um, are we're talking Romney, Green Spring area, all the way up to Kaiser, places like that. Okay. Um, even down to Pendleton County to where the Potomac starts. Uh smoke hole section, all that stuff. Mm -hmm. And everybody thinks the smoke hole is like it's a blue label trout or trout, blue, blue yeah. ribbon trout stream. Mm -hmm. And it's awesome. That's the only place to this day that I'll go to trout fish. Because mm -hmm. you know, all my little local streams population's exploded of people so everybody's out trout fishing now mm -hmm. i can go down there in hunting season and be left alone and trout fish all day and i've caught browns brooks rainbows and goldies all in the same day and a lot of them and it was just awesome and it was off season trout fishing that's good but there's still a smallmouth population there that's fine okay. we really? got to the point last year to where we went i think me and my dad went in october last year and i caught two trout all day but I tore the small mouth up. Huh, interesting. You're not catching big ones. I mean, if yeah, you catch a two pounder down there, you did them. something, mm -hmm. yeah, especially on four pound tests and Absolutely. six foot light action. That was that was a good time. Uh, and then you get farther down towards Romney, towards Green Spring. Uh, the trough is still a good area up that way. Most of it is uh, kayak, canoe, wading. Mm -hmm. uh, there's minimal boat ramps up there. If mm -hmm. there is, it's private. There's not a lot of slack water. Mm -hmm. It's it's the part of the river that's still pretty untouched. Mm -hmm. But you can get into some big smallmouth up there. Uh, before this year, that was where my uh, biggest smallmouth in my life came from. Wow. And it was at a place called uh, Blue, Be Blue Beach Bridge, hmm. right outside of Green Spring. And it was 24 inches. I don't know how much it weighed, wow. but it was a big smallmouth. It was just big and long. It wasn't fat. It looked like the like stereotypical river smallmouth, the big, long mm -hmm. looking thing. But it was nice. <clears throat> um, but that day, I caught 78, and my cousin did doesn't know anything about fishing caught 43 wow. and one day and that was just waiting we tore mm -hmm. them up where was that again uh green spring springfield okay. area up okay. towards uh it's like right outside of romney okay but it's it's on the south branch and it's just it's untouched it's beautiful and mm -hmm. there's a good largemouth population up there i think out of the 70 couple i caught that day six or eight of them were largemouth hmm. and they were healthy fat 15 inch largemouth wow. it was it was awesome um, take a look at there don't yeah. have a weight on it there's a place up there called hanging rock it's outside of romney 
and there's a stretch of slack water there. It's not very big. We took a John boat out. And a guy on the other side of the bank, he was an older guy, probably in his 60s or 70s, had his grandson. They were down, you know, fishing with a push button. <clears throat> and uh, we got out on the river that morning and we were like, catch anything? And we were like, I don't know. We're just, you know, we're just playing around. He's like, but down there where that laydown is, there's a big large mouse swimming around. We seen him yesterday. I looked at my buddy and you know, I was like, that's eh, the only piece of cover in the water. It's not a rock. <laughs> so like, let's go over there. And I flipped a Cabin Creek. I'll never forget it. It was a Cabin Creek roadkill color, three and a half inch tube. And I pitched it at the end of that lay down and got a bite. By the time I set the hook, my line was underneath the John boat. Oh and the freaking end of it just started. I was like, I, dude, I think I got a catfish. I was like, there ain't no way it's a bass. And that thing come up beside the boat. And I just seen that big black line down inside. And I was like, oh, dude. I was like, please get this fish in the boat, man. <laughs> It was there a bit of five couple. It was huge. I got a picture on my phone. Wow. I'd say between four and a half and five pounds. That's a impressive. nice one. Especially a large mouth. Yeah. Wow. And it, I mean, it's just the, it's a beautiful stretch of water mm -hmm. and it's clean. Now, uh, mm -hmm. now that Purdue, I guess the EPA stepped in, there's a big chicken processing plant up there mm -hmm. that was dumping like the, the byproduct in the river. And that kind of ruined it for a couple of years, but mm -hmm. it's back now. It's, it's awesome. Good stuff. Mm. So I do have like, you might have fished here. I don't know, but like, uh, have you ever heard of like Blair, Blair's Valley Lake? I sure have. Yeah. Like, is that a place? Like, I know you, I've been there a couple of times. I've never had success there, but there's a little bit of a boat ramp, and there's good bank fishing opportunity there. Mm -hmm. Is it like a lot of rip rap. Is it is it a place that like you can bluegill fish for kids, or is it just mm -hmm. trout and bass? Uh, trout fishing is excellent up there. Uh, there's <clears throat> bluegills in the lake. I don't really know how big they are because okay. I've never targeted them up there. Uh, my suggestion would be if you want to catch fish to eat and bluegills and crappies, Sleepy Creek Lake's your place. Sleepy Last Creek time I went crappy fishing up there, we caught over 100 between two of us. Oh, wow. wow. We bailed on them. And huh, that's good to know. It, there's a, it's a, it has a very good crappy population. Okay. We didn't catch any giant ones, but I know that there's some big ones in You're there. You're catching 100, I mean, Yeah, that's a good day. It's yeah, fun. Yeah, that's a really well, on the bet. Freaky Franks, the little, uh, yeah. he's got like a brownish purple color worm, mm -hmm. and we couldn't keep him off of him. But Blair's yeah, Valley. That's good to know because. We'll get a lot of times too. Where, where would you catch crappy? Mm -hmm. You can catch them on the river. Yeah. There's a place you can catch them, but no one. Yeah. Sleepy Creek's an here. excellent crappy fishery. Uh, now, Frederick's got big <clears throat> ones, but I don't see the numbers that Sleepy Creek has. All, out of all the crappies we caught that day, the biggest one was like 12 inches, which is a, a mm -hmm. big crappy, but mm -hmm. majority of them between eight and 10, mm -hmm. somewhere around there. Uh, my granddad actually caught one about 2013, 14 on a waggy worm up there that was 17 inches long. It looked like a dinner plate. He's got wow. a picture of him holding his crappy. It was like as big as his chest. That's big freaking nice. It was huge. Yeah. So, I mean, there's there's big ones in there. It's like the bass. So yeah. You got to weed them out. But then like Blair's Valley, is that a place to investigate? Is it is it worthwhile? Because it, it is a lake in Maryland, which is like rare to find. Yeah. We used to go up there and catch a lot of like 12 to 15 inch large now. Okay. Um, there's a lake out in Romney. I'm trying to remember the name of it's kind of similar to it where you go out and just catch numbers but you wouldn't catch big ones if you caught a three pounder it's that a was a good one big deal the biggest one i've ever heard come from up there was like four okay but i know they stocked it with muskies at one point i don't know if that contributed to anything but mm. it was a numbers lake compared to like a, a size lake okay but it, it was always fun and then the last place was like Antietam Creek. I don't know. Like I, I've, I've been trying to investigate that area to try to do some to, to do some stuff there. But like, have you ever heard of fishing that? And is it is there fishing opportunities with Antietam? I used to wade below uh, Devil's Backbone State Park. I okay. park at the state park and go. Uh, you know, there's that dam right there. Yeah. Below the dam, there's the next bridge, and I would smallmouth fish wading from there down. And there's some quality fish in there. It kind of reminds me. You know, don't kill me, everybody, but the Conica jig. <laughs> mm -hmm. it, it's similar to that. You see a lot of trout fishing pr uh, pressure at Antietam, but a lot of people leave the smallmouth alone. Like most of it is, is your trout fishing pressure, mm -hmm. but there's some quality bass in there. Uh, it's kind of like anywhere else around here, like the Apekin, Back Creek, mm -hmm. Conica jig, stuff like that. Like if you wade, you're going to go out and you're going to catch fish mm -hmm. and you're going to luck into a good one every now and then, but mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's decent. Okay. But it's, it's been a couple of years since I've been there. Uh, it's just accessibility wise, it's a little hard. Uh, if you're floating in a kayak or a canoe, you'd probably get a, a better, I guess, a better experience rather than waiting it. But mm. you can still catch them over there waiting. Now check it out. And that's the hardest thing with our, our area because I, I know I don't know our time we have to wrap up, but like it's the fact that like if you're thinking like again, the Conica jig, it exists, guys. Don't freak out. 
but it's hard to get access to fishing. Mm -hmm. The rivers around here are hard to access. So like, I think there are hidden gems, but you do need a jet boat or a kayak. Mm -hmm. You can't just walk out there and then beat the bank like mm -hmm. Lake Frederick. It's, mm -hmm. it's so weird that we do have water, but it's just, it's, it's weird to mm -hmm. get to it successfully mm -hmm. especially if you're a kid mm -hmm. um and i think that was the hardest thing with the channel when i'm trying to like like fish different places and there's like maybe three a kid can actually fish mm -hmm. because uh, like i can tell a kid to go to the kind of he can't physically unless he has specific equipment and spends a bunch of money you can go to jim barnett park or maybe blair lake but besides that yeah like a lot of these places they're good but you do mm -hmm. need a boat a right. jet boat or a big time kayak right. to actually have success mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so but yeah that is interesting that is really interesting yeah, accessibility is definitely the hardest part around here i mm -hmm. mean even for you know, keep talking about it but as a trout fisherman like their territory has really dwindled over the last like 10 mm -hmm. years yeah mm -hmm. but i think a lot of that had to do with uh trash being left behind people just not take care right. of stuff like i know greg up at right. the, the bait shop they do the big cleanup every year which mm -hmm. is awesome mm -hmm. and that'll keep people there fishing for longer mm -hmm. because people in the neighborhood won't complain that all mm -hmm. the fishermen are leaving trash everywhere and I think that's another effort that, that people don't take into consideration is leave it better than you found it. That's right. That's a great point. Mm -hmm. They just, all right, well, I'm done with this jar of power bait. I'm just going to throw it in the creek. Mm -hmm. Or I'm done with this pack of worms. I'm just going to leave the trap. Mm -hmm. No, I'll go out and pick up. I'll stuff my backpack full yeah. of stuff if yeah. I'm walking on the bank. Like, leave it better than you found it. That way you have it to come back to later. That's great advice. It really is. I mean, yeah, being good stewards of, of the resource. I mean, that is huge. And, and we, you know, we don't teach that, like, we when growing up like we were taught to do that remember getting uh, smacked in the back of the head because yeah <laughs> you think you're gonna yeah. leave some trash behind and the idea was too i mean i thought outdoor education even on trails or whatever you know, like you say leave it better than you found it leave no trace mm -hmm. like and the idea too it not it's not sure you you didn't leave it yes but pick yeah. it up pick it up yeah. and carry it out and get rid of it it costs and you zero dollars so, to pick right. some trash yeah and no effort exactly in your pocket yep there's a trash can probably where you're parked at. That's Load exactly away. right. And, and there's away. not a lot of places. And I, I, I hit on that because I guess it's the backbone of this of this channel. What we do here is education and, and really promoting it for kids in the next generation. There's only a few places that you can really take your kid. And if everyone trashes it mm -hmm. and abuses it and we don't take care of this, you won't have the next generation. Right. Yeah, those places yeah. go away quick. Why mm -hmm. does fishing mm -hmm. not grow here? Because no one talks about it and mm -hmm. promotes it to where a kid can actually have success. Because right. we got to protect that spot. God forbid a six-year-old knows where he can actually have success. Correct. And I, I do think that's something like, guys, get out there. If you go to Franklin Park or Briar Valley or Jim Burnett Park, like I, I saw somebody else, like they had, there's a Coke can floating around at Jim Burnett mm -hmm. Park the other day. Like take care of this crap because mm -hmm. we only have a few spots and it's hard as hell to catch fish mm -hmm. in it to begin with. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't know. Yeah. But <sighs> You got anything else? I don't. Know. Chris, anything you want to add? Anything no. for out? Uh, no, I think I'm, we about covered, covered it all. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, I appreciate you yeah. coming yeah. on. Good Thanks for having thing. me. Yeah, the fishing, the DMV, you know, we like I said, we tend to focus on waters here close to us. So getting out, stretching out a little bit north and points west and, you know, into Maryland. Um, and that kind of, you know, says too, like if, you know, anybody out there that, you know, knows of a body of water that they like to fish mm -hmm. or, or has knowledge, um, you know, in, mm -hmm. in the fisheries. Um, yeah, love absolutely. to have you on. And, and don't be uh, scared to try new new water. That's yeah, right. Fish absolutely. your strengths, go there and find, you know, mm -hmm. fish it how you like to fish it. And just because it's new doesn't mean it's bad. That's exactly you right. Get out and find something that you like, and then you got a place to come back to later. Exactly. So, no, and that's 100%. what I, I encourage too, clubs. You mentioned the club, and that's what I've said about, you know, Shanda Valley. It's really stretched me and put us in bodies of water that we maybe normally would not have fished, and, mm -hmm. but it opens up you know, whole new world, you know, to you. So, uh, mm -hmm. that's also good advice. No, a hundred percent. Chris, thank so, you so yeah, much. Thank you yeah, thanks for coming guys. in and sharing your knowledge. Yeah, All you of his guys. information will be in the episode description along with some of the places we talked about and a little bit of bio on this great man. Try to give him a follow, help support him. Guys, my name is Thomas Aarons of Fishing the DMV. And Jared Mounts with Jake's Bait and Tackle. And we'll thanks, see you guys Chris. next time. Thanks, thanks Chris. Guys. You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your hosts, Thomas Aarons and Jared Mounts. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will.